Deutsche Bank analyst Emmanuel Rosner was interviewed by CNBC recently, and he explained clearly how he thinks that Tesla is just running away with the EV market. He said to sell Ford, hold GM, and buy Tesla. We'll watch the video clip where he says that the big Detroit legacy automakers are in big trouble. And with their inability to ramp EVs, this is going to be Tesla's world for the taking. So we have Jeff Lutz joining us. Jeff, thank you so much for giving me your feedback here. Great to be with you, Herbert. Okay. So tell me what you think, and let's go watch uh, this clip, and then you tell me what, uh, how you think this Rosner thinks uh, sees the world. Uh, let's break it all down with Deutsche Bank's Emmanuel Rosner. He has a sell rating on Ford, a hold on GM, and a buy on Tesla. Let's start with Ford. Emmanuel, you question the EV transition. You say it's considerably slowing down. Anything you heard from the call, for example, to give credence to that view? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, good morning. Yes, so the, the, the EV strategy is absolutely slowing down. Um, essentially, Ford announced yesterday they are delaying $12 billion of planned EV spending uh, indefinitely, potentially even raising the possibility of canceling it, essentially saying, look, the economics are not working right now. The demand is not really there for our product. We're going to slow down the spending, the investments in batteries, in vehicles, in plants. We're going to slow it down, see how we can you know, fix things and then reassess us down the line. So our view is this is you know, considerably off track. They reiterated midterm target for EV, but how could you have confidence on midterm targets when you don't really know what's going on uh, right now? So I believe Ford, yeah, Ford is deeply off track on EV. All right, well, what does that mean for GM and or Tesla? I mean, are we sensing that there's an overall slowdown in demand or is this specific in some way to the expectations for Ford products? A little bit of both. Uh, no, not, not specifically Ford, but there is an overall slowdown in EV adoption. I think that uh, this is a lot of early adopters have already bought uh, their EVs. And then the next wave of buyers are basically saying, look, I'm not paying a premium for the privilege of driving an EV. So EVs are essentially expensive for what they are. They sell at a premium to ICE. And that's, I think, you know, basically limiting this uh, adoption curve from, you know, rising uh, as fast as people essentially expected. So this is an issue for but basically everyone. The, but the traditional automakers have had a very hard time being able to come up with a cost structure that enables them to sell the car at the right price. And so Ford, and we have the same issue with GM, essentially lose a tremendous amount of money on each EV that they sell, which basically means that their price are not competitive for what their product is actually worth. Tesla has cracked the code much better and make some money on selling EVs, they're facing a more difficult macro backdrop. But for traditional automakers, we're incredibly cautious on uh, you know, their success in EV. What about this tentative deal with the UAW for Ford? How does it change your, your numbers and their overall competitiveness? Yeah, so the deal with UAW is probably gonna add about a billion dollars of extra labor cost a year, starting as soon as it gets ratified ramping up to about $2 billion of extra cost a year by the end of the contract because there's some escalation in there. So this is makes them even less competitive in terms of labor costs. Obviously, GM and Stellantis will have similar conditions, so no difference there. But certainly versus a, uh, uh, a Tesla or another you know, newcomer, it's also only one of the multiple headwinds we see to uh, you know, Ford and, and GM's earnings as you move into next year. Um, you have these higher labor costs, which are you know, meaningful, your vehicle prices, which are starting to come down. And as we just discussed, EV losses deepening and essentially the success of EV becoming you know, further and further out, if ever. Um, so to us, it feels like earnings are about to take a real meaningful step down as you move into 2024. So Jeff, what do you think about Rosner from Deutsche Bank? Uh, love it that he's a, he's a bull for Tesla. So sell Ford, hold GM. Then he talks about the EV demand is slowing down. <laughs> what was your thinking about when you heard of this? Yeah, I mean, if you remember, Herbert, we did that episode uh, in September where Deutsche Bank visited Tesla, and that was, you know, Annual and his team and having that conversation with Tesla. So they had an in-depth view, in-depth interview with Tesla management to get, you know, the full lowdown on Tesla just, you know, over a month ago. So I, I think you have to step back a, a little bit and, and look at the perspective here. So you talk about the economics of EV. There's a lot of hand wringing going on in terms of what's going on with Tesla and near-term gross margins because Tesla, we you know, is in the 25 to 28 percent range for gross margins, and they've dropped into the you know 16 to 18 percent range 
uh, and everybody's you know all, all up in arms about that drop. Meanwhile, if you look at the big three, if you look, just look at Ford, you know, and, and GM, for example, I mean, they're literally, you know, negative, Ford's at negative 75% EBIT margin, you know, GM hasn't broken it out. Um, but, you know, they're, they've, they've said that they're negative margin on their EVs and they've got a real issue. So you've, on the one side of the spectrum, you have basically everybody in the world, we don't have any data or any information that anybody's producing an EV greater than 0% margins. And here you have Tesla dropping from 28 to 16 to 18% on their own, kind of like controlling pricing and cost structure. And, and everybody's like all up in arms. So I think that perspective is important. The other perspective I think is important is this, this talk about the EV industry slowing. It's slowing for those that are building Model Y competitors like the Cadillac Lyric and, and selling them at a starting price unconfigured at $68,000 when they're competing with a forty-four dollars to $48,000 Model Y, which has the ability to eventually drive itself and, uh, and all the other bells and whistles that comes with Tesla and, and, and the, the, the better performance in terms, of, um, in terms of range and in terms of speed. And that's what they're competing with. So they're at 68, Tesla's in the 40s. You know, Polestar's at, I think, $80,000 for their new Model Y um, competitive uh, SUV or CSUV. And, and, and the Model Y is in the 44 to 48 king range. So that's what's happening. You have these vehicles that are uncompetitive in performance and specs, and the demand is slowing down for them. And so they, they, they entered the year with about 40 to 50 days of EV inventory, the, the non-Tesla um, EV manufacturers in the U.S. And now they have close to 100 days or more. Some models are up at 200 days of inventory. And that's what they're talking about. So they have uncompetitive product at uncompetitive pricing. And guess what? It doesn't sell. It doesn't have anything to do with, you know, the EV, EV itself. By the way, they have, a, they have charging network deals that start in 2024 with Tesla. And so for them to capitulate now tells me that the economic woes are much, much deeper than previously known. The fact that just three months ago, they were you know, you know, getting into a supercharger deal with Tesla to kind of unblock this consumer challenge with range anxiety and the ability to charge and just a couple months later, after getting basically free supercharging access from, from Tesla to, to the capitulate on the rest of their CapEx investment, tells me that the economic woes are that much deeper. So I agree with the calls from Emmanuel. I don't know if I'd have a, a hold on GM at 33, um, but I agree with the calls. And I, I think, you know, I think these automakers are in serious trouble because the future is EV and they've shown no ability to produce EV and, and then delaying this out a year or more, what does that do to their supply base? What does that do to the confidence in them? What does that do to their ability to um, to ramp up and be ready for larger volumes? Where's Tesla going to be a year from now? Where's Macro going to be a year from now? Rates are going to be getting cut, and you know these Teslas that are now at, in the mid 40s, Tesla's going to keep you know prices competitive, and the rates are going to be lower, so the the price per month is going to be much, much more competitive to buy a Tesla than ICE or, an ICE or EV competitor uh, from the others. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com. Okay, so the, uh, the show that you and I just did, uh, where you and I looked at Nick Cola's uh, interview that I did with him, you brought up this new idea, which I loved, which is this concept that uh, Tesla investors should start realizing that there might actually be an option play just for the automakers themselves, the auto industry. So most of us who invest in Tesla, we think of it as an option play because we're waiting for FSD or robots or energy to come pop up and take over the stock. But you've been pointing out that perhaps with the capitulation of these uh, legacy automakers, and so now we're seeing Deutsche Bank, and I'm sure many others are going to start to downgrade Ford and GM. We're seeing that as a sell. This could come sooner than... Uh, uh, talk a little bit more about that because I think that's a good concept for us to share again. Yeah, there's an, so, th so the, the concept is, is as they do this transition to EV, 
Um, and so Tesla's well into this. They, they're now producing in the millions per year and their competition start in, in, in North America. Um, Ford and GM have, have said they're delaying their EV efforts. They've said it, you know, a couple of months ago, but now they formally came out. And you know Ford's delayed 12 billion in capex spend. They may have de- you know delayed it indefinitely, but right now it's it's some indeterminate point. GM is uh, uh, is delayed certain models and delayed capital spend as well. They got a lifeline with the with the supercharging because they each had to spend a couple hundred million dollars on that, and they got a lifeline from Tesla earlier in the year. So the whole the whole thinking here is with Ford and GM you know, doing the Stellantis is really nowhere uh, in terms of EV traction. And then you have VW cutting shifts and cutting supply of their primary product line, the ID3 and 4, and really talking about the economics of EV. And then Porsche um, is talking about the pricing BMW and and um, and Mercedes are also, they've on the record saying that the, the pricing is very difficult to contend with an EV. So the thought is, is there an option play that's kind of lurking in the background where there's this EV volume that needs to be fulfilled globally? You know, Europe's growing significantly, China's growing significantly, the US is still growing, growing 40% year on year in terms of EV adoption. So there's no data out there through the third quarter, through September 30th, we were in the five to six percent range depending on what metric you look at for EV penetration in the U S last year, now we're at 8%. That's data. There's no other data that says that that's changing. What is changing is the inventory is growing on the competitors. So there could be an option play lurking for Tesla where, you know, they grab more and more market share, uh, not only just EV market share, but total market share as these competitors capitulate by one more thing at some point, they have to point their capital dollars towards EV. And then there's going to be a lead time for them to ramp that up. And while they're doing that, they're pointing capital dollars away from ICE. And what happens there? What happens with that cost structure is those volumes start coming down and the fixed costs start weighing on top of smaller volumes in ICE. So it's an interesting thing that could play out. I'm not saying it's all doom and gloom and there's a, a straight line for Tesla. Tesla has a lot of hard work to do in front of them. But we're witnessing history right now. We're seeing this capitulation right right in front of our eyes. So I'd, I'd say it's going to be an interesting thing to watch over the next couple of months. A um, few people are being able to follow us along except for us. <laughs> so we just watched Rosner from Deutsche Bank, who's a bull. To balance this out, I'm going to go ahead and play a clip of uh, Steve Weiss, who's with Short Hill Capital. He's a bear. Let's watch what he says and... You tell me what you're thinking here. I think personally Tesla's one of them. I think Tesla right now is on an extended downtrend. You'll see continued volatility like it's up today. But to me, that stock is still grossly overvalued with fundamentals that are failing. So so I'm not stepping in and buying that. This is what you tweeted out and you're on X. You said analysts who go to the library to research stocks know none of the Ford catalyst and put my PEs in my spreadsheet and sort them if it were only that easy. That's funny. So tell me what, uh, what you meant by all this. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like, you know, remember the old, you know, yellow pages and phone books. If you wanted to find somebody, you go by their last name and you thumb through the A's, the B's, the C's. And that's what, you know, some analysts think it's that easy. Just go, you know, put the PEs in a spreadsheet and sort through it. And the highest risk ones have the highest, you know, PE. And the lowest risk ones are the ones you you bet on, um, and that's just not how it works. You have to understand the forward catalyst. And and Nick did a great job, you know, in your interview with him this weekend, Herbert, uh, basically talking about how to value Tesla. And I think that's where a lot of the bears, a lot of the uh, the the funds get Tesla wrong, is they don't know how to value it. And and those that have valued it on the on on these option plays, I think have done better uh, because Tesla's put themselves in a position to to survive and thrive. And there's no path that says the rest of the automakers are surviving through this. So I think that's what it, that's what it comes down to is how you value the company and understanding the forward catalyst and knowing that there's risk on this. It's definitely, it's not zero risk. Everybody should do their own research, but it's just a completely different style about about how to value a company. And, and these analysts that have held these positions on Tesla, they've been wrong 
for years. And um, so I, I just, I leave it at that. There's, I think there's a very, there's a different way to value a Tesla a Netflix and Amazon um, and Nvidia and so forth. And, and at different times, you know, those companies will have their moments and then you have to go reset and have another look at it. I just don't agree with the way that he's looking at it now, which is basically like astrology and reading prior performance, which is looking at a trend line as prior performance. And you can, you can overlay technicals. That's fine. Um, but you really have to understand the fundamentals of the company and you have to understand the forward catalyst before you just do the technicals alone and just looking at peas. Okay. So we've just heard three different analysts here. We got uh, Emmanuel Rosen of Deutsche Bank. We've got uh, Steve Weiss of short, whatever, short hill capital. And we've got Jeff Lutz, the best analyst we have. Thank you, Jeff. Follow Jeff on X at the Jeff Lutz. Thanks.